you as you all know, I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of uh, books and there are a lot of tips about writing research articles. And some of you have been there, done that already, I'm sure. But there are also other parts of the publication process and parts of research articles that are perhaps talked about less for whatever reason, and which arguably can make a difference. Um, I mean, all of you are under pressure, I assume, to publish, publish a lot and publish in good quality journals. And you want to um, tip the scales in your favor um, as much as possible. And so that's what this workshop is about. How can you give your, how, what are some aspects of the publication process and of research article publications that uh, people don't really talk about very much, but which can make a difference in terms of creating the impression that you, that you desire. And we hope to, uh, that you come away with some practical tips. Okay. So um, a little bit about myself, uh, which you've already seen in the bio. I am, um, I am a, a, a researcher here currently at the University of Arkansas. I'm also involved in a writing center network in Brazil. So not only am I familiar with the, the publication needs of people in this side of the world, United States, but also other parts of the world. And I also am an associate editor for a, um, a journal uh, for, uh, published by Oxford University Press. And so I also sit on the other side of that fence and I know um, what it's like to receive um, articles and, and, and manuscripts and the impressions that, that uh, the different impressions that can be caused and, and what can cause good impressions, what can cause not so good impressions. And today we're gonna start with um, titles. And you might not have, not have thought a whole lot about what a title can do, but today I hope you come away with um, some practical tips of how you can improve titles and why they're and knowledge of why they're important. Uh, Talin's going to be talking about uh, abstracts and their importance. So these are the two potentially the two first things that you see on a manuscript. And then um, what are sometimes called occluded genres, so genres uh, that people don't really talk about uh, with the publishing process, including cover letters and um, clarifying contributions, and finally, a little bit about revising and, and resubmitting. And at the end, we'll have time for further discussion and questions and answers. Okay, so we're going to start with title. And basically, the main message is that uh, the, a title can, make, can go a long way to set um, expectations, the expectations of the reader. Now, of course, uh, the first person to read the manuscript when you submit it is going to be the editor. And then after that, immediately following that is going to be um, the peer reviewers. And so you want to make sure that you put your best foot forward and uh, set the expectations the way, um, in the best way possible, achieving the exact effect that you want. So I'm going to start with you and I'm going to ask you to reflect on your own titles. And <clears throat> today I asked you to uh, bring titles, which we'll talk about in a little while. I wanna ask you, um, in your opinion, how important is a title? So one is from one to five, one being not important, five being extremely important. In your view, how important is a title? And there, there's a poll being run right now. Just go ahead and, and give your answer. 30 of you um, said that uh, it's extremely important. And so I'd like to invite uh, those people to, a, a few of you to, to talk about that in the, in the chat. Ada Smirnova. Yeah, hello everyone. I think it is very important also. My choice was probably extremely important, but I'm somewhere in between four and five here in the answer, because normally we as readers of the academic uh, body, we, we don't read the whole articles, we just read the titles and uh, scan the abstracts and then we decide whether it's um, probably introduction, then that's it. And then we decide whether it's worth reading or, or not. So I think it's important for the reading. And uh, what I remember from my book writing experience that 
uh, my editor was very, we, we discussed my book title for a lot uh, for a long time we couldn't kind of agree we, we, we I, I remember probably 20 of them different versions of the title and they were very because they insist that it is a selling part of the book the title yeah yeah well I mean that's right I, I agree with both what Maria said and Lada said I mean uh, first impressions are very important and we'll come back to that a little bit later today that notion and Lada that's very interesting about what you said about um, the the selling aspect I mean in the end if you have if you write a book you want people to well um, buy it you want people to read it and and so you're kind of selling it and so you're thinking you know you have to think kind of like a marketer you know what's going to be the best way what's going to be the the most attractive um, sell for for this and um, I think of I think of uh, you know how I'm sure you as Lada did how much we, we how much thought we put into the titles um, and and I put as much thought into titles I think as I put into uh, naming my son uh, because you, you think about okay I'm I'm naming I'm giving a person a name and this is the, the name of the person going to have his whole life and and you think about not only it, how the name sounds, it's, its own aesthetic, but the effect it's going to have. I mean, are, are people going to shorten the name when they talk to him? Are they going to give, does it, is it, does it lend itself to a nasty nickname? Um, how will it sound in other languages? All this kind of thing. And so you, you think of the effect. And so that's, that's kind of one of the key messages I have is uh, you think of, you want to think of what the effect is going to have on the recipient of, of the, of the manuscript, what kind of impact, what kind of effect will it have? And it's going to be the first thing, as as Maria said. So I'd like to uh, to remind you, everybody here, of the typical sort of IMRAD structure that everybody here is, I'm sure, familiar with. In the typical empirical article, you'll have um, with some different disciplinary variation, you often have an introduction, your method, the results, and, dis and the discussion. I like to emphasize, though, that um, there is an interconnectedness between these things. And so um, there can be a cascading effect of uh, setting reader expectations and setting up your introduction. And then, um, for example, introducing new variables, introducing important variables, the introduction, which then you pick up in the method and so on. But here, I'd like to argue or posit that an important part of this internal cohesion of the article is the title. Um, and that it's, it should be considered a part of um, the IMRAD, not, not disconnected from it. And um, I like to tell the anecdote of the naming of this building that you see here. I'm from San Francisco, California originally. And this building, that this yellow building, the structure that you see here, was erected in 1998, and nobody kind of knew what it was about. But it had this this name. You can see here on the side a little bit. You know, something about a carousel and this name Z E U M. It wasn't very well um, advertised, but what it was called was this Zium, and in fact. I only learned of its pronunciation relatively recently in 1998. Um, I wasn't even sure how to pronounce this name. I kept saying Zoim or something as if it was maybe German. And um, this title, this, this name that this, that this museum received turned out to be um, a big problem. And so um, just so you know what th this was about is Zium was actually short for museum and uh, what the purpose of this museum actually was not to have art on the walls, but a place for interactivity, especially designed for children, especially for STEM. So uh, children could, or STEAM, could enter the building and create their own um, uh, games and interact with all kinds of interesting things. And so the title basically did not do justice uh, to the to what the experience was, and so in 2011 it was renamed the Children's Creativity Museum, which of course was much more successful because, first of all, it is a more transparent title. You you know 
what it's about more or less, but it, it, it sets expectations um, before you walk in. You expect, first of all, that it, you expect to find other children in there and that it will be good for children if you have kids and that there will be some kind of uh, um, creativity built into uh, the, the place. And it has a kind of museum aspect of it. In other words, there'll be things that will be displayed. And so it sets expectations from the very beginning. And this was a successful renaming. Um, the press release from Zium later on said this, although the name Zium sounded fun, it didn't provide parents with any clues about what they and their children would experience. And so this is an important thing to me in my mind is that providing a clear expectation or here they call clue about what the reader will experience in an article can be very important. Because um, going back to this, this IMRAD structure here, this, this can be a complex um, interlinking uh, set of, 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 of sections. But let's say that for whatever reason, um, you write an introduction and you include inf any kind of extraneous information that maybe for whatever reason might confuse the reader at, in the introduction level. If you have a good, clear title, it means that the editor um, or, and or the peer reviewers seeing the title, they know what, what to expect. And so even if for whatever reason they get a little bit confused here in the introduction of what's going on, they can remember or go back to the title and say, okay, it's right. So the point of this article is this really. And at some point the author is going to get to that point. If you have a, think about it the other way around. If you have a confusing title and then you don't for whatever reason have a very clear cut introduction, then that just sets everything off the wrong track. So that can really make a big difference. And I know that I myself as an editor, um, and as a reviewer of articles, when I, when I uh, get confused about what the articles, what the author is trying to say, I'll often go back to the title and say, oh, right, okay, so this is the main point here. And that can help me get to the end of, and you really want the, of course, if you have a manuscript under review, you eventually want the reader to move on to the end and get to the end. And you don't want that person to give up and say, oh, actually, I don't understand what they're trying to say and get frustrated. That's the last thing you want to do. So, um, so that that I think is an interesting anecdote about how a title made a big real life difference in this case, and how a title should be considered an important part of the structure. Now, I want to move on to um, your titles and abstracts, and so you don't have to do anything with them right now. But if you've brought today a title and an abstract, please ha have those ready. Um, on your computers, if possible. Because what we're gonna do in a minute, is I'm gonna ask you to do a kind of cut, a rather copy and paste activity, um, a practical uh, thing. And um, you don't have to do it right now, just kind of uh, have it ready. And as I, as I think um, the Academic Writing Center asked people to do, um, is bring a title and abstract today of either something that you have already published or something that you're, that you're working on. Either one will be fine. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about a few of the titles uh, from articles that I've written. And the reason I'm telling you about this is to kind of give you an idea of the thought processes that went on um, uh, be, before the title was put out and to, give, to kind of send the message about the strategy involved in title choice. So um, in this one here, which is the effect of frequency and idiomaticity on second language reading comprehension, my thinking uh, behind it was that uh, there was all, already a lot of research about frequency. In this case, frequency means um, the effect of common words on reading comprehension. Common words meaning the, the most common words in the English language. And so you have a whole body of research in English language teaching that, um, that basically provides a theoretical framework for 
difficult and easy reading, for example, reading for children or reading for English language learners, there's a lot of research already on word frequency. Separately, there is a whole body of research on what's called idiomaticity. Idiomaticity is understood to mean um, multi-word phrases often that don't mean don't that, that don't, don't carry a literal meaning. So if you if you read the the individual words, the meaning uh, is not the same as the whole of of the phrase. An example is a uh, typical example would be a piece of cake. Uh, a, a piece of cake can have a literal meaning, but if you say, oh, that that test that I took at school was a piece of cake, you don't mean, of course, a slice of cake, you mean that it was very easy. And so that's what idiomaticity is. So again, there is a whole body of literature on vocabulary frequency, a whole body of literature on idiomaticity and its effect on second language reading comprehension, but there wasn't anything about the the juncture of those two concepts. In other words, when a, an idiom or an idiomatic expression is made up of um, very common words, what is the effect of that, of that idiomaticity on the reading comprehension of people whose lang first language is not English? So this was um, the bringing those two things together in the title because I wanted to emphasize that I'm addressing this gap, that yes, these two things have been talked about separately, but not together. And, um, and so that was my title choice there. And later on, I'll talk about why I chose this journal. Um, another example, I call this a kind of transparent title type, uh, it was just called a phrasal expressions list, very boring title but intentionally so. And uh, it is a title that was made, to, it was designed to mimic um, the, the title of an article that had come out, a research article that had come out years before called an academic word list. And so uh, years prior to this, a researcher named Avril Coxhead um, wrote an article um, talking about her research on uh, the most important vocabulary for academic English. And she created this word list, an academic word list. And this, this word list is so common that people just refer to it as the AWL. People know this list very, very widely. And so I wanted a title that um, hearkened to that, uh, that original title that would remind people of this title. It was, it was specifically designed to, to sound a little bit like that title because I wanted this research to fit into her research. Her research, uh, Avril Coxhead's academic word list was uh, focused on individual words. And this, and this list um, is very similar in function, but it focuses on multi-word expressions, which uh, in this article are called phrasal expressions. And so that was the strategy behind it. A lot of thinking about and the, how the title should fit into that research conversation. Um, another example, uh, uh, listening for needles in haystacks, how lecturers introduce key terms. This was a little different. Uh, here, this research focused on uh, second language learners. In, in this case, the context was the UK and, uh, and I, I was asked to do research on what are the, the typical problems that uh, non-native English speakers have when listening to lectures in another, in another country, in an English speaking country, in this case, the UK. And so to do this, I recorded several, several hours of university lectures and I conducted a, a, an analysis of the discourse of, of the words they used and how they structured their lectures. And what I found was that lecturers um, don't really plan, at least in the UK, this UK context, this was mostly an MBA program. Um, lecturers did not prepare their lectures very well in the sense that uh, they, they built their slides and they just kind of spoke 
sort of extemporaneously. They would they would they would often um, use metaphor and anecdotes in the middle of a lecture, uh, which was fine. It was very dialogic. Uh, but what would happen is often because of that kind of uh, uh, chaos in in the lecture, um, and it was well intentioned chaos. The lecturers wanted to give examples and things like that. Because of that kind of chaos in the lecture, key concepts um, often were, would get lost. So they would often only refer in passing to a key term, important terminology that, that, that the students should have written down and tried to make note of, but it would get lost in all this other discourse. And so I wanted to, I wanted to bring across uh, this, this concept of uh, an important thing that is lost in a kind of mess of, of discourse. And, and the metaphor that came to mind was that of a needle in a haystack, because I'm sure it's similar in Russian, you probably have something like this, where something that's very difficult to find is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. And so this discoursal mess, this, this lecture mess, I, would, I called it a haystack, and then the term was like a needle. And so uh, that concept, was an image that I thought kind of encapsulated the idea that I wanted to bring across. Uh, but then I needed to explain that a bit more. I couldn't just leave it at that. So that's why you have the column followed by how lecturers introduce key terms. So then they can understand the relationship between those two things. So again, a lot of thinking about how to sell the research. And then finally, um, there's this one here, which is shows how uh, a lot of titles can use quotes. Maybe some of you have done so here. In this case, this research focused on um, how people who are non-native users of academic English, so not just British, not just American, not just Australians and so on, but people from other countries uh, where English is not the dominant or the, or the, the main language, um, how academics in all those other countries are now beginning to help shape the way academics use English um, in journals, in academic journals. And, um, and so I have in the second part of this title, this evidence of elf and non-native English forms in international journals, which is clear, maybe not for you with this elf part, but I know that my colleagues in this journal, I know I'm speaking specifically to my colleagues uh, for this particular journal, I know that they know what ELF is, uh, which is English as a lingua franca. And so I didn't need to explain that. Um, and I knew moreover that this, 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 this um, acronym of ELF would stand out to them. So I, I have that there, but I wanted to reinforce that even further to show the kind of, the kind of ELF language that I was talking about. And I went back to a manuscript that I found from Argentina in my research analysis uh, that had this phrase in it, especially in the last years, which deviates from the kind of uh, language that I would use, for example, because I don't say specially, I would say especially, meaning particularly. So that is a, that is a use of special that is not my English. And instead of saying in the last years, I would say in recent years, not in the last years. I know that from this is a direct translation from Spanish, but I was also able to show in this study that people from other countries are now using such forms on a regular basis and that these forms are being included in international journals. And so this is evidence of this English as a lingua franca. And so the choice was, I wanna give an example and then um, and to reinforce this concept. Uh, whether or not these were good titles is arguable, and, and, and uh, one could say they were good because they were successful. Ultimately, they were published. I, don't, I wouldn't say that they're the best possible title. Um, they, were, they, were the title they were the titles I thought about a lot, and I think they were good. But today, even if you have a title that's been published, as I will show you in a little while, maybe you can think of a title that could have been even better, and I'll show you how. Um, I just this here this this about this idea of community membership is something that I want to bring across because um, as I just mentioned in that title about um, elf is that you are obviously not 
devising a title and writing a title in a vacuum to, to everybody on earth, but you're, you're writing to people that you hope will read the article. And in most cases, I would think that when you write your, your manuscript, you're, you have a particular reader in mind, maybe even a particular journal in mind, maybe even particular people in mind, as I often do when I write. I think, hey, I'm writing this. I wonder what Tolin would think about this article. I wonder what Svetlana Sachkova would think about this article. I have, and I even think about what, what objections would Svetlana raise about this? She's a critical person. I bet you she would, she would want me to explain more about this. And so it's the same thing with the titles. When I write a title, I think, okay, what is something that would call would would catch Talyn Phillips' attention? What is a title that would catch Svetlana's attention? I want her attention. I don't want everybody on Earth's attention. I want these people to pick up my manuscript and be impressed by it. To you about something called uh, the rightful title generator. This is a, this is a kind of interesting device that I came across not too long ago. I think it was just last year. Use this what they call a title generator. I was very skeptical about this at first. I thought, you know, surely a machine won't be able to think of a better title than me um, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm me, I'm a human. But um, I guess, you know, as we see that even computers can be better chess players than the best players of chess in the world, and then maybe now algorithms are reaching a state where they can help us think better as well. And so, um, this rightful um, title generator, what it does is it asks you to copy in an abstract into, um, let me make sure that I'm sharing this here. Yeah, I guess I am. Um, to copy um, your app, to copy and paste your abstract in this abstract box. And then you just have to click regenerate title and it gives you um, a new title. And so let me show you a, a couple of examples here of what, um, what I did here. So this, this is a, a different article that I wrote um, a few years ago with colleagues in Brazil. And uh, this was basically a short, a short article um, to that uh, basically was communicating that we had developed a new instrument for classroom observation in the context of what's called EMI. So uh, I don't know if you have this at, at um, HSE, but uh, EMI is essentially uh, uh, classes that are taught through English um, in, in countries in which uh, English is not the normal medium of instruction. And so uh, for people who conduct research on the effect of teaching in, through English in such contexts, there was no instrument available and we developed one. All right. So what I did was I, I copied and pasted this abstract again, just to keep you uh, remember that this was the original title. This is the title that was published, An Instrument for English Medium Instruction, Classroom Observation, Higher Education. It's a mouthful. It's kind of long. And so what I did was I copied that abstract and I pasted it um, in there and in that rightful. And it gave me this instead. It said, we suggest you know, this title, Interactivity in Higher Education, a Classroom Observation Tool. I tell you that if I had seen this title before I submitted the other one I showed you, I might have chosen this one or maybe something very similar to it. I like it much more. It's punchier. It's sort of it's shorter. Um, it's it, it it actually will have a broader appeal. Um, so interactivity. I mean, it, the first word is the main thing. It's the most important part of the research. That first word, interactivity in higher education, a classroom observation tool. I think I probably would have chosen this title instead of the title that was ultimately um, published. Too late now, but for you maybe not. Um, so that's why I'm giving you this tool today. But with that, uh, I'd like to segue to, to Lynn. To Lynn, you wanna talk about the abstracts now? Yeah. So um, it's great to be with you guys. Uh, I'm excited to be talking with you all. Um, 
we are going to talk some about abstracts which you clearly all have some experience with because you had one to put in the chat. Um, let me see if I can get my screen share going here. So I think one of the things that it's important to talk at least briefly about is that lots of these things vary by disciplinary norm. Um, and, and so as Ron was talking through the title types, so I started in the field of teaching English as a second language, but more of my work now is in rhetoric and composition in the US, which is working with writing for a lot, a lot of times for native English speakers. And so when I made sort of this transition or started to move into this new field of rhetoric and composition, one of the things I noticed very quickly was what a huge difference there was in the norms and the discourse in writing, and in particular in titles, in that in TESOL and in applied linguistics, there's a much higher value placed on that kind of straight, transparent title. And in rhetoric and composition, that would often be read as really boring or too not interesting enough. And so we are big fans of the concept plus elaboration or the quote plus elaboration, which is my personal favorite. I think if you look down through my CV, probably half of my publications use the quote um, form. So yeah, there are all these different interesting differences between different communities of practice, but depending on where you might be working. So one of the things that I really talk about some key parts of the abstract today and sort of why they are important for readers. So take a minute and write some responses in the chat. Why does the abstract matter, do you think? And what does it do for readers? What is it? So the abstract tends to serve kind of three primary functions, which, and I think you guys have hit on most of these in your comments, providing this standalone kind of mini text or summary for potential readers, for reviewers, and it serves as a screening device. So along with the title, trying to decide whether you want to read this or not. And then it also provides indexing help for people that are creating indexes. So I really talk with writers about the abstract being your second chance for persuasion, that your article is valuable and worth reading. So I don't know if we have any other fans of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, but one of the last scenes in the book is there's this ancient knight who's been guarding all of these grails. He's been guarding the Holy Grail. And so in order to get access to the Holy Grail, you have to pick one. And the person before Indiana Jones does not choose well, and he dies a very grisly, grisly death. And so the knight as Indiana Jones is picking up the the Holy Grail says, you have chosen wisely. So choose wisely as you think about your abstract and the ways that it can help to persuade your readers to go ahead and read your, your piece. So abstracts and lots of other genres work by having a set of rhetorical moves or a set of functions, or you can, <clears throat> sorry, as communicative stages that text within that genre perform. So certain things that basically any good text in this genre, they're all gonna do something like this. And so they don't always come in the same order, but if really essential moves are missing, then the text ends up being less successful or maybe completely unsuccessful. And so we're gonna look at a couple examples here in a moment um, of more and less successful abstracts and sort of how they use those moves. So in abstracts, some people that have done some genre analysis identify basically five moves that happen within an abstract. And so when you're putting together your own abstract, you may have had this experience. I don't know if you have Mad Libs in Russia. This is like a children's game where you're given this short little story kind of thing and you're asked to plug in, you see cinema, synonym for new, a sciency verb, you're asked to put in a kind of word 
And then in the end, you generate something that's really funny. So this was a joke from this site called PhD Comics talking about abstracts as Mad Libs. And I think what this joke is getting at is our shared sense, even if you've never talked about genre analysis or rhetorical moves before, that these things are operating and that there are specific functions that you have to fulfill within the abstract and that lends them to all sound quite similar in some ways and to use similar sentence stems, similar language to get across key ideas. So within the research article abstract, when researchers say there are five moves, these are what they tend to be, although there's definitely variation across um, different fields. And even within fields, sometimes you just don't need all of these. But the first move is what do we know about the topic, this kind of background or introduction piece? What's the study about? Something that really clarifies what's the research, what's the purpose of this particular article? How was the study done? Um, is there some information about the methods and materials? Certainly in the social sciences, this piece can be very important for readers in that screening piece as they're trying to assess in an area where there's lots and lots of research, well, how closely does this particular study match what I'm interested in? If you're interested in adults and this study was done with children, perhaps you're gonna skip it because the population is too different and it's not gonna be meaningful for you. What was discovered? What were the results or findings? Or if you're more in the humanities, people would be looking for a, a pretty clear argument here about what this study, what this piece is about. And then what do those findings, findings mean? Some discussion, talk about what the implications of those are. So we're gonna look at a few sample abstracts um, some of these come from a book by John Swales and Christine Feek called Abstracts and the Writing of Abstracts. Um, one of them is actually one of my husbands from physics that I borrowed because it made me laugh. Uh, so we're going to look at a few. You can decide. We're going to go into breakout rooms here in a minute. And you can choose the, the abstract that is most applicable to you, closest to your field or faculty. But we'll, in the interest of time, maybe we'll just go through the one from education, since quite a few of you were in there. So this was how I assessed it, and it may not be exactly what you came up with. I think a lot of this depends, too, on whether we're working inside our field or outside of it, that there are things that just don't quite make sense to us or that we would understand in a different way if we were more closely tied to that community. Um, okay, so for education... I thought there was a pretty clear move one in the first sentence, which was very helpful <laughs> for me as a reader, really clear. Here's what this is about. Pre-kindergartens are expanding, but there's not a lot of evidence. And then move two and three seem to me to be fairly clear in the second sentence, um, although not so much about the method, but using rich data from an early childhood longitudinal study, um, seemed like the, the method, although not a ton of detail. And then the purpose, we estimate the effects of pre-kindergarten on children's school readiness. And then I read the rest of the abstract as providing the results and findings. I don't know, skip ahead. Again, you'll, you'll get this after the, um, after the presentation. And so you can look at what I thought the rest of them were. The one that I find to be the most problematic is the one from art history in that I don't find there to be a clear reason, sort of why does this exist? What is the contribution of this study here? Um, sorry, as I quickly flip through these, but you can take a look um, and sort of see how your assessment compared to mine and and what some of those differences might be. And you know, all this here is bringing up another gap um, that we have in the publication process, which is uh, when I ask reviewers to look at manuscripts and they go through all the revision process and everything, reviewers, they tend to focus only on the manuscript alone. 
so issues uh, in in the in the manuscript in the article rarely do they point out um, problems in the abstract and then I think it's up to us me I would think now going forward as an editor I'm going to tell authors okay now that you've made a revision to your manuscript make sure you go back to your abstract and Absolutely. see if there's anything that's necessary to change there because uh, it, it kind of gets overlooked and it's important yeah I think that's right the last two uh dissertation writers that I've been on their committee before for uh, I've hassled them about the abstracts because they just weren't nearly clear enough. The contribution wasn't there. Um, and so as we think about in the same way with a research article, you know, maybe the only thing that anybody ever looks at from this 200 page document is your title and your abstract. You want that abstract to actually represent what you did and also to represent you well. You don't want somebody to look at the abstract and think, what on earth is going on here? So in the interest of time, I've put together a couple of things that you could do after the workshop if you're interested in working on abstracts some more. One of the ways to get a good handle on how the norms in your own faculty differ from those of other faculty is to get a group together of 10 or 15 research article abstracts and compare and contrast the moves that are there what language gets used and things to get a better understanding. So those moves number two and number four, the one about making clear the purpose and then what was discovered, those two moves are the most common across all fields and all abstracts. And whether the other one shows up, show up does vary a little bit from field to field. So this is something you might wanna try later if you feel like you really wanna do some more work on abstracts. Um, but before we close out this piece, I wanted to take a second to talk about what abstracts do for writers. So we've been very focused on what's the impact for readers, which I think is very important, but the abstract can also play an interesting role for writers. So take just a minute and maybe put an answer in the chat of what you feel like the abstract can do for you as a writer. A few things that the abstract can do for writers, if you let it, there are other ways to get at these same goals and you may not choose to use the abstract for it. But a couple of options are, as Svetlana was mentioning, it really does help you to create focus and kind of provides a touchstone for you as you write to keep bringing you back to those questions. Yeah, Katarina mentions it's, a it's feedback for myself. Um, what am I doing here? What's the thing I need to do next? What is my argument to keep that focus? It can also really let you see how your project has evolved over time. When you go back and you look at the abstract and say, but that's not what I'm doing anymore. That's where I started, but this project has changed and now it's doing something different. And then sort of along with that to really clarify or solidify new insights or new directions that might have come up. Another thing you could try after today is to consider some kind of regular abstract writing as this process of assessing and clarifying your project for yourself and ultimately for your readers. But again, there are other ways to do that. I know um, I was talking with some grad students about this a few days ago, and, and one of the other facilitators said, you know, I got too focused on my abstract for my dissertation. I felt like it had to be perfect. And so I kept going back to it in this sense that it wasn't good enough yet. It wasn't good enough yet. And that I think can be really counterproductive and kind of paralyzing for you as a writer. If you're able to treat it as more this thing that's just a reflection of where the project is in the moment, then it could be really useful to go back to it repeatedly. So I think this is one of those things where there's, there's definitely not a right answer. It's about how you work, what your process is, and probably what the particular project is. I think in the humanities, we're more likely to have a project that evolves more over time than perhaps in some areas. And so maybe this practice would be more useful for those of us in the humanities, perhaps than in another area. So now we are gonna go on to talk about cover letters. Okay, so we're coming towards the, uh, near the end now of, of the workshop today. So please uh, hang in there. 
we'll, we'll, we'll speed up a little bit now uh, and talk about uh, cover letters. You know, why do they matter? What should they contain? Um, let's, let's start with the first question here. Why, do, why does, uh, I'm sure many of you have submitted a cover letter. Why do they matter? Or is it just some kind of uh, perfunctory, perfunctory thing that you have to do? Let's see. But, uh, I can show you today that they, they do matter and, and it's something so simple and yet can be, I think, uh, so important. They can go so wrong. Um, yeah. So here is, here is, here is a, an example. This is, a, this is a, an adapted, it's an anonymized real cover letter that uh, came into, I used to run a writing center and uh, this was uh, uh, from a real article, a manuscript. So what do you think? Do you think this, go ahead and read that. And you can tell me in the chat uh, if you think this is a good example or not and why not or why. I think you all caught on to some issues here. It's, it's impersonal. I would say that if you know the name of the editor, even if it doesn't get to the editor, uh, you might have an assistant editor, it's good to put the name of the editor there, I think. Um, and uh, there's nothing here specific about what the manuscript is. Uh, as Lada just said, a couple sentences of why it might be, why the article might be attractive to this particular journal would be good. Um, there are a couple of um, mistakes and um, it's, it sounds very impersonal. Okay, so as you know, most journals these days ask for um, a... Uh, a, a, a cover letter and often the more and more depending on the publisher it's something that is actually forced you actually have to put in something and the, there's a field that you have to put in something um, in any case it's always a good idea to to put in the cover letter uh, because as many of you po pointed out it's it's the first impression and it can immediately send a message of okay this is something that's new, it's interesting, and I've chosen this journal to, to um, share this interesting and new thing. And the basic ingredients, as, uh, as exemplified here from the Journal of Molecular Biology, is that you should have an outline of the basic findings, if it's an empirical research article, and, um, and also uh, the significance, why, that, why that's important. That's what they ask for specifically in that journal. Not all journals ask for that, but it's a good, it's a good formula for, for success. So uh, generally speaking, cover letters, uh, what you typically see, and this is a good structure, I think, is a brief summary of what the research is, um, why it's important, what the contribution is. I also like what many people said here, why you chose this particular journal. So it immediately sends a message to the editor that you're not sending a bunch of manuscripts just to wherever accepts it, but you've chosen that particular journal for a particular reason. You've, cho you've chosen that journal strategically. Uh, a declaration that you have not submitted elsewhere is sort of um, what is expected normally in, in uh, in the journal submission process, the manuscript or submission process. And then some journals, they even ask you to recommend reviewers that you want, um, that you think would be good reviewers. And those can be, um, can be appreciated by journals sometimes to help uh, find peer reviewers, or you can even put ones in that you think should not review in some cases. Uh, So Andres asks, what is the difference of point one from the abstract? So um, I'll show you that in a second, Andre um, and everybody, what I mean by, by how it differs from, from an abstract. So here is a real example. Um, the only thing that changed here from the original version is I didn't put the name of the editor. So this had the editor's name on there originally. Uh, and this is from that article I showed earlier, phrasal expressions list. So you see here, we have the pleasure of submitting a phrasal expressions list for your consideration. The paper presents a corpus derived list of the 505 most common, useful multi-word expressions in English. 
One unique feature of the list called the phrasal expressions list or phrase list is that since it contains frequency information that matches the top 5,000 word families in English, it can be integrated into existing word lists and therefore tests graded, graded readers, etc. As the phrase list fills a pedagogic need similar to that of existing lists such as the Coxhead academic word list, we felt that TESOL Quarterly, where Coxhead first published her work, clearly was the best journal to submit uh, our paper to. So what do you see here? You see that we have, we, we put in the title, my co-author Norbert Schmidt, we put in the titles so that um, we believe that this title is relevant. Um, then we talk about what it does. And so this is different from the abstract. It's a very sort of one, two sentence summary of what it is and why that matters. And here we talk about what the findings or the main product is of the research and then why that's unique. Um, and then furthermore, we talk about why this journal. It's a, I think this covers a lot of the points I mentioned earlier. You do have a brief one sentence summary of the research. You do have um, the importance of it and you have why this journal. There are a couple of things that are missing though here. Um, so uh, one, I already pointed out that um, I didn't mention the name of the editor here. There's also one more thing that, uh, or at least a couple more things that I could have included in this. We haven't talked about yet that um, I think is worth putting in is that I don't talk about what the specific manuscript type is. So I don't say submitting an original article or a review article or an original research article because every journal has specific categories for publication. And so I don't say, you know, what, this, what the specific type or specific category of manuscript it is. I just say the title. This makes the job for the editor a little bit harder because they have to say, okay, which, which category is this going to go into? Is this, which, which, what kind of manuscript is this? And so that is a piece of information that is missing. So, um, and you'll receive a copy of these, of these slides. Here's a general sort of Mad Libs type of structure as uh, to Lynn talked about Mad Libs that you can use to help remember of this structure and you can, and you can reuse for your, and, and to adapt for future submissions of, of, of your manuscripts. I recommend putting in, you know, dear, and then specifying the name of the editor, then some general wording about, we are pleased to submit, blah, blah, blah. Then making sure that you put in the article type, an original article, a brief report, or whatever it may be um, entitled, then putting the title for consideration by, and then putting the name of the journal. Then talk about what's special about it, what you did and why it's important in this paper, uh, and then you can borrow some language from the abstract here. We did this. We believe it makes this a contribution because blah, blah, blah. Then talk about the journal. We believe the manuscript is a good fit for this journal because, and then refer to a specific reason. This is about the dialogue um, in your scientific uh, discipline. And then uh, a statement about the originality, not, not having been submitted elsewhere, and then um, optional, the thing about the reviewers. Again, you will receive a copy of these slides if you want to adapt this text. But let me go back to this bit here about um, the, uh, uh, the first part, the original research article and how you, can, how you can make sure that you put in the right wording there. I recommend everybody, this should be something that everybody does anyway, is to go to the journal page um, before you submit. And this should, should seem like an obvious point, but uh, make sure that you go to the guide for authors and you know, go to the author information specific thing, and then look for what, what they cover and how they call, uh, what denominations, what categories, they, they, what specific names they give to the article categories, because then, you can say, okay, um, this is um, a, a conference report, or this is uh, a book review, or this is um, whatever, 
whatever the specific wording is that they use, you can borrow some of the language and use it in the cover letter. So just make sure that the editor sees that you have chosen that journal specifically and are using the, the type of categories and the, the type of um, language for, for submission that, they, that they're looking for. All right, so finally, this will, this will end our session today. Before we go into the question and answer, we'll turn it back over to, to Lynn. All right, so what is the most important thing to know about the publication process? I would say that everybody gets asked to revise. I think when you're a really new scholar and you're submitting things to journals and you get that revise and resubmit, you think I've failed because they didn't accept it. And after you get a few more um, publications under your belt, you realize this is the default, revising and resubmitting in response to feedback. Um, and it's usually not fun, but it is an essential part of the process. So, and typically when you get the reviews back, you often get two and the reviews from the first person are very positive. And then you get the reviews from the second person and they are not. And so there's a whole, I, I imagine this has made it to you as well. Certainly in the US, there's a whole set of memes and jokes around reviewer two because reviewer two is always so mean. So, you know, nothing reviewer two. Uh, the journal reviews be like, everybody loves it. The editor loves it. Reviewer one, reviewer three, they all think it's fantastic. Reviewer two thinks it's ridiculous and there's no way that you're ever going to get, get it published. Um, and then in the vein of um, Ron's title generator, I don't know if reviewer number two read the paper or if they just have a review generator. And certainly if you've submitted it a few times, you may have had this experience I definitely have where you read the review, but really, did you read this article? Because we addressed all these things very clearly. How are you asking this question if you've read the, the article? So dealing with reviewer two is difficult, but it's something that everybody works through. This is another kind of meme that circulated a few years ago um, with these stick figures. This is reviewer two. Reviewer two is an angry and bitter scholar exacting revenge on their peers through overly critical anonymous rejections of papers they secretly wish they would have written. Reviewer two does not like puppies. Don't be like reviewer two. But what we're gonna talk about today is sort of how to work through reviewer two. So one question that I had for you all, as you think about working through responses, do you have to respond to all reviewer feedback? So take particularly for substantive concerns that they've raised, you're, you will have to address them, but there may be other things that are minor that you can skip over. Um, one thing that I think we learn early in the revision process is to declare something beyond the scope. And this is sort of the simplest way to deal with difficult feedback that's really pulling your project in a different direction. So you might deal with some difficult feedback with a, a sentence or two like this. While X, the thing that the reviewer has raised, it's very important or interesting issue. It's beyond the scope of this article, which is focused on this other thing. Or this makes it an important area for future research. However, it's beyond the scope of what we're doing here. So there might be some ways that you can just section off um, a, a big portion of difficult feedback if it really is beyond the scope. Now then you may have to subsequently make the case to the editors and to the reviewers that it really shouldn't be part of the scope. You know, it's always possible that the reviewer will really disagree and say, there's no way you can do this without dealing with this. But this is one way of dealing with some feedback. Um, another question, can you disagree with some of the feedback and still get published? It is possible. It's tricky. And I would say it's trickier to do than to actually avoid some feedback um, because you have to figure out how to argue with this reviewer in a way that doesn't make them too angry and that the editor, <clears throat> excuse me, will actually agree with you. So 
in order to do that, you do have to provide a really clear argument that the editor is going to agree with about why the reviewer, the reviewer is wrong. Now, I just want to share uh, from an editor's perspective, uh, in my experience, when you have something like this, I'm going to share my screen really quickly here. This, this is this kind of response has, has, in my opinion, in my experience has shown to work. So when an author does this, so here is the first part is comment one, then what the, what the reviewer said, and then responses, what, how the authors respond. And the same thing, it follows the same thing all the way down. Comment two, uh, abstract, uh, here's what the reviewer said, and the response from the author is, thanks for pointing, this, pointing out this, we have revised the statement. Comment three, there's this problem that the reviewer says. The response is, thank you. We tried to discuss this as a limitation. So they're, they, are, they are specifically addressing, uh, first of all, recognizing the comment, then saying what they did to address it. And it could be something as, okay, yes, we changed that. And um, from a reviewer's perspective and from an editorial perspective, this seems to be, this seems to result in success. Um, just talking briefly about um, extensions. So this is something you often will get asked as some journals have an automated process that they work through that will give you a deadline. In other cases, you have more flexibility. Most of the journals that I've published in, you get the revise and resubmit and it's like, do it someday. <laughs> and you're sort of on your own for figuring out the timeline. Um, and personally, I've worked more with editing book chapters and working with authors in that way, which is quite different. Um, so just a little bit about if you can't meet whatever the deadline is, what can you do? Depending on the situation, that deadline may not be important to the editor at all. If it's something that's been automatically generated by the um, submission system, the editor may not care at all if you're going to turn in something late. So you can always ask the editor for a little bit more information. Is this deadline flexible? Uh, you know, how important is it? In contrast, if you're working with deadlines for page proofs, before the um, editor is getting ready to submit the whole journal to physically be published or something like that, those deadlines are really serious. And if you don't meet those, you're really messing up a lot of people, the editor, all the people that are in charge of production. So it can be, it can be really valuable to talk to the editor a little bit if you know you're gonna struggle to meet that deadline, or if you think you're gonna get there and you're a week or two out, and you think, wow, this is not going to happen. Um, it's good to talk to them about how important that deadline is for them. You can always request an extension. It's a good idea to go ahead and suggest a new due date, something that you know you're going to be able to meet. Um, I think there's a temptation for us as the writer that we feel bad asking for a favor and we're trying to justify why we need more time. The editors don't really need exhaustive explanation of what's gone wrong. I think we've all been there. We're especially, especially after COVID, you know, we've all been struggling to keep up and to juggle everything. So you don't need a huge explanation, but just a few sentences may be enough. But if you do know that you're going to need an extension, I think it's really polite to not wait until the last possible moment. Or what I often see is a few days after the deadline, then the person finally writes and says, yeah, I need a little more time. Just go ahead and ask for it in advance. And then if the editor is able to grant it, they can work your project more effectively into their planning for their own work. And then of course, you wanna make sure that you're gonna make the extension if you get it. I think it's not particularly good form to ask for an extension, but then still not be finished. So I think there's a temptation on our part to overpromise, to promise something more soon than we might actually be able to do it. So I think as we ask for extensions, you have to be kind of realistic about when am I really gonna be able to get this done? And so here's just a quick sample you know, thank you for your helpful comments on your draft, something specific about, you know, when you said this, this was really helpful for me. Um, 
your message requested a revision by this date. That's the end of my semester. Is it possible for me to submit by the 30th instead? If not, I understand and I'll do my best to meet the deadline. Or if you know the editor better, you know, if it's somebody that you're working with on a book project, you probably have more of a relationship. You know, it can be quite informal. If, if I were to go through my email, I would see a lot of informal requests for extensions. But, you know, is there any flexibility in the deadline? Could I get it to you by this later date instead? So it doesn't need to be something that you feel terrible about. It doesn't need to be something that you spend a ton of time on. But I think just getting a sense from the editor earlier on about whether this is possible and then sort of communicating with them in a timely manner about what deadline you can actually meet and then meeting it. Thank you everyone. <laughs> Thank the you. same to you. Bye. Thank you for, for inviting yes. us. Indeed.